Hello and welcome to the fifth magazine monologue. Uh, Scientific American has finally come in. It is the April 2021 edition. So today's magazine monologue will be coming from that edition of Scientific American. The head title of that edition is The Math of Making Connections. Uh, today's article is titled Seeing Clearly. It is written by three uh, professors from the Australian National University. Uh, I apologize for getting the first two names probably wrong. Uh, the third name I should get right, but it is Tony Travillon, uh, Celine de Orgaville, and Francis Bennett. The first two are professors of astronomy. The third one was a professor of, I believe, optical instrumentation. Uh, the article talks about what is called the adaptive optics loop. Basically, it's a method for astronomers to kind of simulate the removal of Earth's atmosphere when taking a picture. So I'm sure we've all done this, or seen this, or noticed this. And if you don't know this off the top of your head, you can just do it right now. Uh, if you take a glass of water and you put a straw in, or a pencil, or whatever you have, you'll notice that like the angles are kind of off a little bit. That is called refraction, and it happens in the atmosphere as well with light. Uh, this is not going to be a physics course. The article is about optical physics, though, so it's going to come in. Uh, so due to that, and the thing is the atmosphere has many, many layers of different thicknesses, different heat, different densities, basically, um, that cause different levels of refraction. So in the straw example, it's like one refraction, right? It's just water, air, that's it. But in the atmosphere, you'll have multiple, multiple levels. And so if you are looking up and you look at the star, and this is actually the reason stars twinkle. If you look up and you see the stars twinkling, that has to do with the light from the star not coming in flat like it should, it's coming in all wavy because it's hit all sorts of different levels of diffractor, refraction um, throughout the atmosphere. All right, so that is the problem that adaptive optic loops are trying to solve. How does it work though? What astronomers have done is attached a laser to a telescope and they, and I believe it's an orange laser. Uh, they didn't actually specify the wavelength, but they did mention the color orange at one point. Uh, an orange laser that shoots up in the atmosphere and there is a layer of sodium in the atmosphere that get hits by the laser and emits an orange light. We know here on the ground, um, I wanted to say on Earth, but the telescopes were on Earth. We know what the waveform should be for the sodium that gets lit up in such a fashion. And so that is our like known baseline. So what happens is this laser is pointing into the sky, hitting the sodium, and then it's bouncing back into the telescope. And what happens is the light comes in and the computer knows that it should be like this, but instead, because of all the refraction going on in the atmosphere on the way up and, the, and on the way down and just everything, it comes in like this. And so the computer will, then read it and be like, oh, okay, so it should be this. How do I get it to look like this? And what it does is the light comes in and hits a deformable mirror, which actually means that there are a bunch of actuators underneath the mirror, it's essentially pistons. It pushes the mirror up a few microns, brings it down a few microns, does whatever. And the computer tells the mirror, or the actuators really, how should they move to turn this into this? And it kind of, and it does that, not kind of, it does that in real time. Uh, because as the earth rotates or as there are winds pushing different densities around or just all sorts of things, uh, the refraction is going to change. The high-end optical loops are, um, what is it called? Adaptive optic loops. The high-end adaptive opt optic loops do this either at this millisecond scale or the fractional millisecond, millisecond scale, meaning it's thousands of times per second, uh, which is a massive computational and mechanical feat because basically imagine you have this little actuator going up and down right going up and down pushing the mirror and you have i don't know thousands of those on a large telescope and all of those are moving thousands of times per second it's impressive uh, and it just does that on repeat so you use this guiding laser to, to shoot up into the sky we know what it should look like when it comes when it's coming back to us but because of the refractions it doesn't look like that so then you correct the mirror and it can help you artificially remove the atmosphere of the earth to get crisper images of things in space. Uh, the example that they gave in the article is a picture of Neptune. Basically the original picture, insanely blurry. 
I mean, it's just, it's a blue circle that's really, really fuzzy. Applying the uh, adaptive optics though, they can make the picture appear much more crisp. I will admit that the picture kind of, I don't want to say looks fake, but it is like very clear that it is not a natural picture. It's like very clear that a computer has been involved. Uh, I assume though that based on the fact that it's in Scientific American and they've been using it for since the 90s, 30 years, uh, the astronomers have been using it since the 90s. The US military has been using it since the 70s. Not really a surprise. Uh, but so the astronomers have been using it for about 30 years. It, I, I assume it's accurate. Uh, I don't understand why scientists would use an inaccurate method. So that's my assumption moving forward. Uh, and so it just does that on repeat. Inside the telescope, it reads the guide laser, sends all the actuators to tell them how to move thousands of times a second, and it does that. The article also discusses two different uses of this adaptive optics beyond just imaging stars and exoplanets and asteroids and everything else. The first one is space debris uh, management. Basically, there are 34,000 man-made objects orbiting the Earth, anywhere from 200 to 3,600 kilometers um, in miles. What would that be? Uh, doing it real, real quick off the top of my head here. I think it's like 120 miles to like 2200 miles, give or take, give or take. That was a rough, just off the top of the head. But up in orbit, 34,000 that are about 10 centimeters or larger. So basically think this larger, larger. Uh, another, they didn't actually give a number, but they said hundreds of thousands that are in the like one centimeter to 10 centimeter range. And then they said over a hundred million that are less than a centimeter in, ra in range, or in size, I keep saying range, in size. Uh, the goal is to use these adapt adaptive optics to better image and catalog the space debris that is up there now, because the problem is something called a Kess v. Kessler syndrome. What that means is there is a fear, not a fear, it's actually kind of a reality. At some point, there will be too much stuff orbiting the planet, at which point it is likely that there will be some sort of catastrophic failure uh, cascading failure is what I meant to say, sorry, cascading failure where certain orbits will just be unusable because all the debris will be clogging up all the space. But this is under the assumption that humanity doesn't find a way to clean up the orbit, um, clean up the atmosphere, or to make the orbits just generally uh, smoother and clearer. Smoother is not the right word. Uh, I think humanity will do that. Uh, we've conquered many, many things. I have an expectation this will be conquered as well. But all that said is you can use the adaptive optics to map and catalog the space debris in order to provide guidance to uh, SpaceX when they're launching all these little small satellites. Be like, hey, avoid this specific orbit or avoid this area of the atmosphere, things like that. Uh, the second use is in quantum encryption, which they did not go into details of how quantum encryption actually works, so I'm going to be talking in very broad strokes here. Quantum encryption is going, it, it uses light to encrypt messages, and the way that adaptive optics can help with that is if you want to send a secure quantum encrypted message, which is, when, quant when quantum encryption becomes much more viable, it's going to be the go-to. Uh, it's unbreakable, right? Again, in a hundred years, is it going to be unbreakable? Probably not. But for current today's technology, definitely. Uh, so what you would do is you'd shoot a laser up at a satellite, and then that satellite would shoot a laser down, I don't know, to another receiving station on the other side of the planet, or on another continent, or anywhere else. You could use fiber optic cables, but for various reasons that might not be entirely doable, especially if you think uh, like national security realms where you could set up different intelligence agencies or special forces units or whatever to have a receiver anywhere on the planet. You're not gonna have a fiber optic cable to those guys. Um, so if you could bounce a laser from a satellite down to them, significantly better. The problem though, is the same problem that we had in the beginning. You send a laser up and you want it to look like this, but because of all the refraction, it's gonna look like this. So you would send a laser up and then it would go back down to the receiver and the receiver would need to have some sort of um, 
adaptive optics loop system so that way it could fix itself and make this image back into this image and you would get your encrypted message back. Uh, that said, it was it was an interesting article. Uh, I, I admittedly chose the article that I thought would be A, the both most manageable to understand and B, the easiest to explain. Uh, there are some math articles in here that I'm definitely gonna read. I'm not certain I'm gonna do a video on them. Uh, and then there are actually some more fun articles that I wasn't certain exactly how I might be able to do them. The fun article, fun article, fun article I have in mind is there's an article on a biomechanics and an illustr biomechanics um, professional and an illustrator bringing like mythical creatures to life and how they would work. Think like Pegasus or the Chinese dragon or things like that. It's got a lot of pictures and that's why I think it's fun. I'm not entirely certain it will transfer to this medium as well. Uh, but regardless, um, this was the fifth magazine monologue. And now that I have Scientific American, Economist, Time, Foreign Affairs all set up, and I'm gonna be getting 14 others after this, it is highly unlikely that I'm going to do back-to-back -back days with the same magazine. It is more likely that I'm gonna do, I'm gonna cherry pick an article from here, from here. It's possible if I have two, really, two or three really good articles from one subscription, I might just do those all in a row, but uh, expect more diversity in moving forward. Uh, thank you.